All right, we are live. Welcome back to your Friday edition of Elevate Your Grind, brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. I am your host, Todd Rosales, and I hope everybody had an amazing week. It is Friday. We've made it through the week. We've had some fun. We've accomplished your goals, and we're getting ready for Memorial Day weekend. I know I'm excited. I hope you guys are all excited, too. Um, should be a really interesting weekend for cannabis sales. I mean, 420 was great. We're we're getting out of the pandemic here, folks. We're on the tail end of it. We see light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm really interested to see what happens this weekend. But thank you, everybody, for joining me today. We've had some awesome episodes this week. I hope you really enjoyed those conversations. If you missed any of those, you can check those out at youtube.com slash elevate your grind. Or, of course, anywhere that you find your podcast, just search for Elevate Your Grind. Please make sure to like and subscribe. That's how we get to keep going. And that's how you show us your support. So typically I would go into all the hubba blue about everything that's coming up, but I've got a great guest today. So let's just get into the conversation. Um, my guest today comes from a company that I'm really excited to learn more about. So when I got into the cannabis space, you know, I was trying to get my legs under me and figure out what was going on, what, where it was legal, where it wasn't legal, all these different things. And then, you know, I get educated on the fact that the country of Israel has been studying medical cannabis exponentially longer than anybody else, right? So when I came across this company, I was very excited to talk to them, talk about the medical side of things, talk about the scientific side of things, and really their approach to deploying cannabis in our country. Because right now there is very much a recreational component to it. We're not saying this doesn't fit in it, but this is truly a medical cannabis company, in my opinion. So with that being said, Please welcome my guest today, the Chief Revenue Officer of Tikkun Olam, Todd, Tom Grebenstein. I almost called you my own name. Tom, thanks for joining. <laughs> Pleasure to be here, Todd. Uh, really excited to have a conversation with you, man. Absolutely. And I want to give a shout out to my friend Susie Ganelli for making this happen. Susie, thank you for setting this up. But Tom, you know, I've wanted to talk to you guys for a while, and I know you and I have gone back and forth from a rescheduling, but as I understand it, you know, a lot of the products that you guys have are, are actually backed by science and, and studies and, and years of research. So for those Americans over here that, that may not be familiar with Tikkun Olam or really the history behind it, can you just kind of give us the brief overview? Typically, I'd start with your background, but I think people should understand the importance of the Tikkun Olam backstory. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's, it's, it's a fascinating story at that. And it really um, very much so is the origin story of, of modern medical cannabis. Uh, so a, a number of years ago, our founder, Saki Cohen, uh, rotated out of the Israeli, Israeli military as part of his uh, compulsory service over there. And as many do, he went on, uh, on a trip uh, after, after uh, uh, rotating out and spent some time in Southern California, uh, where he really uh, fell in love with the cannabis culture there, uh, obviously illicit at the time. But, uh, you know, enjoyed that and started to really uh, get a good understanding for the therapeutic benefits of cannabis. Um, so when he went and uh, made his way back to Israel, you know, as many folks who have served do, he struggled a bit with some PTSD, uh, living on his family farm up in, in Safat, which is uh, kind of the, in the northeast uh, region of Israel. And so his mom uh, quite candidly said to him, hey, we're on a farm. Let's grow some weed. Uh, you know, if that if that helped you, then let's yeah. move forward with it. And so he did. They did, and they uh, they started uh, culturing uh, what would eventually become our uh, our one of our flagship strains, Eras. Um, and it helped him so much that he started sharing that with other people, uh, with other veterans, with Holocaust survivors, with cancer patients, uh, with uh, myriad people. Uh, and so, fast forward a couple of years. And he's got close to 3,000 patients illegally under his care for free, uh, by the way. It was all done on, on a communal basis. Uh, you know, if you're of able body, come out to the farm, trim plants, cut clones, uh, deliver to those who are homebound. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, for those who are not able to do so, no problem. Uh, we got you. Um, obviously, that's untenable. Uh, that many patients, yeah. you know, to the point of, you know, people lining up at his, uh, his apartment in, uh, in uh, waiting to try and get access to medicine. Um, so he kind of took another page out of the California experience and uh, rented a couple of buses and bussed a whole bunch of patients down to the Kineset, the Israeli parliament, and staged a sit-in. So if you can imagine all these folks, especially, you know, some older folks, Holocaust survivors with their, in their walkers and their wheelchairs and whatnot, basically 
barricading the parliament uh, until they agreed to take up the issue of medical cannabis, which they did. They issued a very small number, I believe it was three licenses. Uh, and the first one that they issued was to Tikkun Olam. Uh, and Tikkun then became the very first company in the world licensed to produce medical cannabis. Certainly there were caregiver systems in place in places like Colorado and, and California uh, prior to that, but we were the first corporate entity um, licensed to, uh, to produce cannabis. Um, and of course, being in Israel uh, at the Hebrew University, we gentlemen who we all uh, know of, uh, Dr. Raphael Meshulam, um, saw this happen and uh, got in contact with Saki and took him under his wing. So um, as a result of that, um, you know, they were able to not only perform real clinical style research, you know, double blind placebo controlled studies as you would for pharmaceuticals um, on our particular strains, but also then to develop additional medicines and capture um, over 20,000 patient records uh, to actually provide proof of the uh, the efficacy of, of symptomatic abatement for individual strains. And we continue that legacy of research now. Uh, you know, we, we generally publish uh, between two and five uh, studies annually dealing with things like post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, uh, Crohn's disease and other IBDs, autism, uh, uh, Parkinson's, uh, all types of other, uh, other ailments that we've found um, particular strains are, are, are good at treating and we try to provide that actual proof. Uh, so that folks can feel secure in treating their symptoms. See, and, and this to me is what defines what our industry should be about, right? Um, listen, I'm, I'm all for adult use or recreational or whatever you want to call it. And, and similarly, but even in that vein, you know, more recently, and I think a lot of people should take this up. I'm very often on Leafly, which is our form of research, which is essentially crowdsourced, looking at terpene profiles and different things just to continue to define the things that I enjoy. But I think it's so important to remember that really a lot of the importance of, of making this plant available to everybody is from a medical and therapeutic and wellness standpoint, right? I'm interested to, to understand your opinion on this, but you tell the story of the origin and the sit-in that they organize, you know, folks, uh, Israel is tiny, you know, it's not a massive population, especially in the grand scheme of the world. So when you have a solid quantity of people that are important to the state, Holocaust survivors, veterans, and everything else, you know, that are, are have programs to be supported by the state. I feel like because it was Israel and you had this small number in any other country of protected, dedicated individuals, you know, people that the state would value saying we want this, that they were quicker to say yes to it than maybe the United States where we have 300 million people. And that would really be a blip on the radar. Do you think the fact that it was a small, nimble country for that fact kind of opened the path to be able to go down this medical route? I, I certainly think there that uh, that was a factor. I mean, let's, let's be honest, you know, you've got fewer people living in Israel than you have living on the island of Manhattan. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a small population, but it's a very insistent and very proud population. And of course, uh, the, the fact that Dr. Mishulam had discovered THC in 1964 over there and then uh, with Ruth Galili uh, and her team uh, working so diligently in, in the discovery of CBD and the definition of the endocannabinoid system over years, there was a, a, a legacy of research already in place. Uh, if you've never seen it, I highly uh, recommend grabbing a documentary called The Scientist, uh, which, uh, in which Dr. Mishulam details his own uh, discovery of, of THC. And that's a really, really interesting story. In fact, uh, including him uh, re recognizing that the, the uh, most likely analog to the human endocannabinoid system was that in the, uh, the brains of pigs. Um, and try finding a pig's brain in 1964 in Israel. Uh, you know, not, not, not happening, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that as the fact that, that all that research had been conducted and there was so much discovery that had taken place in Israel, um, the population of the government was more accepting of, uh, of a legalization effort, certainly. Hey, what was the name of that documentary? The Scientist? The Scientist, yes. Okay, yeah, I had to write that down because I definitely want to check that out. I mean... To me, I think this should be all not required reading, but I think that everybody who gets into this industry should have some kind of knowledge in this space. I always talk about one of my favorite guests on this show is, is a um, 
a, a woman by the name of Erica Daniels of Hope Grows for Autism, right? And mm -hmm. the reason I love speaking to her is because 90% of the conversation we had was not just her entrepreneurial journey, but really how she used cannabis, black market cannabis at the time, not to throw under the bus, to treat her, her autistic son. And the, the quality of life, how, how much his quality in life improved and how she can do different things with him. And, you know, when I sit here and I see people that are protesting this and saying that cannabis will kill your children and it leads to more degenerates and, and more. I saw something that said uh, they're, they're trying to link the increase in alcohol related deaths in Colorado to legal cannabis. It's like, well, what? No, you, you definitely don't know real cannabis. No. Now, don't get me wrong. Maybe the cannabis users who are also alcoholics and everything else, you know, there are people of addictive problems. I know I went off on a tangent, but going back to it, like it's very hard for me when I hear a story like that about a mother, you know, wanting to take care of her child by any means necessary, that's not going to harm her child. And then how someone can be so against it. Right. And then here I look at Takuna Lam and I start going through your research and you see, you know, people leveraging your products for MS, autism, cancer, Crohn's disease, epilepsy, Parkinson's, you know, to me, that's where the essence of this business comes from. I imagine, you know, with, with, and I don't know if you'd be the right person to ask for this, but there has been a lot of studies and research and really just documentation on leveraging cannabis for these, um, you know, these ailments. You know, is that where a lot of your focus is, at least at the corporate level at Takun Alam, as you guys are developing new products with that true medical mindset? Or is there another part of the company that's like, okay, we want to keep the core of the medical, but let's also kind of attach this new group that's using it socially in a wellness standpoint? Well, I, I, I think that we are uh, at our heart a, a research organization. And so uh, that certainly does lend itself more towards the clinical side of things. Um, but and I, I would um, I would create the, the delineation not necessarily between medical and recreational or medical and adult use, but between clinical and self care. And I think yeah. that uh, you know when you're talking about the use of cannabis, um, you are also looking at uh, you know ways to relax, ways to de-stress, ways to manage your mental health in addition to you know specific symptom abatement. So. Um, I don't feel that there really is uh, a, a, a anyone in our company who would say, no, you know, this is a recreation, strictly recreational product or anything of that nature, because, uh, you know, managing your downtime, uh, enjoying yourself is certainly a, a very, very important part of everybody's health. So that being said, um, you know, our research does focus on individual symptom abatement because those are identifiable and definable items, whereas uh, you know, there, there is a bit of uh, the definition of self-care and, and uh, even to a certain extent, uh, mental health is, is a bit more nebulous and really uh, esoteric to the individual. I actually really like the comparison when you say clinical versus self-help, because that's something I actually struggle with. Like, you know, and I see it all over the Internet. Like, what do you care? What do you compare cannabis to? Do you compare it to alcohol? Do you compare it to pharmaceuticals? Do you compare it to supplements or anything else? When at the end of the day, it's it's kind of, you got have to compare it to all, right? Because there are so many different use cases. So that's why I really like when you say clinical versus self-care, because yes, mental health is a major part of why people leverage cannabis. And just because it doesn't come in a little pill form, even though it does now, you know, widely, um, you know, people don't accept it as much, but hundred percent, what, what attracted me to cannabis was managing my mental health. And I didn't even realize it till after I started doing it. So, you know, I really appreciate that clarification. I'm just curious to know, you know, how did you get into this industry? Because you're in a great position with a great company. You know, I, if I remember correctly, you come from more of the, the medical background. If I, I remember reading, um, seeing an interview, you actually did Funny enough, uh, was it preventative medicine? Oh no, for some reason I thought, oh yeah, pandemic response work. Pandemic That's, response. I can't even yes. read my own. I I can't even read my own notes. So you were doing pandemic response work, and now you're in cannabis. Yeah, I, uh, I've been in healthcare management and, and healthcare sales for the majority of my career. Uh, healthcare operations. Uh, I started out actually in immunology, uh, and then moved on. I ran a nationwide uh, network of travel immunization clinics for folks who were looking to, you know, travel to exotic places and needed to be immunized appropriately. I did some work in wellness, in healthcare technology, 
uh, and uh, and then you know was literally just running my own shop, uh, doing some consulting work, particularly on Salesforce alignment and whatnot. And uh, I was recruited. Uh, literally picked up the phone. Headhunter called me up and said, uh, "Have you ever thought about being in in cannabis?" And I said, "No." And and I got to tell you, it was um, it was a life changing moment for me because certainly I had consumed cannabis previously, but I myself at the time had never really thought of cannabis as medicine. And I am a multiple qualified patient. Um, I have a fused spine. I'm missing a kidney. I am allergic to opioids and I have Crohn's disease. So um, when I first then got introduced to cannabis as medicine, um, I had not slept more than four consecutive hours in 15 years. Oh. And uh, my Crohn's disease was rampant and poorly managed with pharmaceuticals. And, you know, now, Hey, I sleep eight hours a night. No problem. I have my can my Crohn's disease is wonderfully managed and in remission. Uh, you know, so it, it really was so serendipitous to me that this, this headhunter reached out and, and, uh, and found me. And really it was only by virtue of my location because I was living in Jacksonville at the time and Takoon was looking for somebody to manage their relationship with Vitacan and, that's how I, I got into it. Very cool. I mean, you know, I hear these stories again and, you know, you backing up to, to how you got into it and your experience with cannabis, like you said, you qualify multiple times and it was mismanaged with opiates. I can't tell you how many times I hear a story like that, or just people that don't want to be on opiates anymore, or the addictive properties of opiates and everything else. You know, it's funny. And I say this probably on every episode and I say it a lot in real life. And we've all used this quote, but the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. We're doing the same thing over and over again with addiction, with, with opiate treatments and everything else. And we're expecting different results. We have the ability to try something different, something more natural. And, it, and again, I'm probably going to keep saying this throughout the entire interview, but it blows my mind that, you know, some people can be so close minded to this. I mean, you know, you have the experience looking over when we look at a country like Israel that has a lot more of a definitive history around true cannabis research, because for some reason, this country doesn't really allow real cannabis research. I know that's kind of changing now. I read something with the, the you know, the monopoly the University of Mississippi had on, we're not going to see that gross mids weed anymore in, in studies. But, um, you know, how is medical cannabis looked at over in Israel? Because I don't believe that there is rec or adult use over there yet. It is very much medical. But I, I'd love to understand the stigma around cannabis over there, just how it's viewed, if it, if it is more accepted just because of the research and the experience. Can you give us a little bit of insight into that? Uh, certainly. I, uh, it is very much accepted there. And, and not only uh, from a clinical side, but yes, adult use has been legalized and export has been legalized. So, oh, it has. Uh, Look it at has, me not yes. knowing anything. <laughs> there are, but there are now, you know, whereas to, for many, many years, Takoon was uh, the, ex, you know, the, the big dog on the block and probably had a 90% market share. Um, that has since changed. There are a number of, of uh, folks over there now producing uh, medical cannabis. Um, certainly, I think the Takoon stuff is the best. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they have transitioned now, whereas previously, um, medical cannabis was a uh, item of last resort. Basically, you had to exhaust the entire medical system and, and have, you know, basically be terminal in order to be admitted to a clinic. Um, and in fact, that's why we, uh, at the time, were managing so many nursing homes in Israel, because, uh, you know, we were taking care of folks who are really, uh, you know, down to their last attempt for, at health. Um, but now it's, it's transitioned where uh, the medical cannabis is actually available through the pharmacy. Uh, it's a, it's a pharmacy-based system. Folks can basically any pharmacy in Israel is now stocking uh, medical cannabis, and it can be uh, had very easily. And a, a very very sizable uh, amount of the population or, or proportion of the population is uh, currently uh, on some sort of therapy or self-medicating. See, that's great to hear that, you know, and that's what I hope that happens with our country is as we actually have real research and articles start coming out, of course, who knows what our media will do with it. But, you know, as we start seeing this stuff come out, that the stigma around it will change because I, I personally believe I started to see it during the pandemic, cannabis deemed essential people locked in their houses. I think the court of public opinion on cannabis changed and the pandemic really accelerated it so to hear that you know israel especially with your 15 years of research with the kunalam that 
you know, there, there is real science, real articles, real data that people can point to, to fend off a lot of these bullshit arguments that we don't, you know, the, these arguments that are being based off studies from 1910 with, with cartoons in them and shit. Right. So, <laughs> yes. um, you know, it's great to hear that you talked about Israel being, and this is such a little thing that you, you mentioned. I don't think anyone besides me cares about it, but you said they got cleared to be able to export cannabis. Is any country actually allow the importing of cannabis, which is, I'm curious about. Yeah. Uh, so actually uh, it is, uh, it is, is happening. Uh, the entire European union now will allow imports of cannabis within the EU. So wow. uh, we're, that's why we're starting to see in particular, uh, Greece has a, and, and there is a, a Takuna Alam division in Greece, uh, but Greece has a very, very favorable outlook on cannabis production. So I really see that as being the next big powerhouse of, of production over in the EU as they will then have the ability to, to export to other EU countries. Um, Britain is also, uh, though, though they have exited the EU, is allowing uh, for importation of cannabis. Wow. As a Greek Jew, I'm very happy about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, now you know where to get the, the, when you're over there to get some good Greek Jewish weed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, shit, I've, I've got to plan a trip to, to the islands there, man. But no, that see, again, this is just the ignorant American me paying attention to our markets here when we have the European Union, which, you know, is the closest representative of the United States, but they're not really, a, you know, they're a union in, in, in politics. They're not the United States like we are, where it's all one country and we can't even bring stuff from, you know, California across the Lake Tahoe line. Like literally, if you're in Lake Tahoe and you go from one side of, of I think it's Harris to the other, technically that's illegal if you have your weed on you, right? Correct. So, yep. you know, you, I'm sure if you've been out to Tahoe, you've seen the casinos that have, or the, the hotels that have the casinos on one side of the hotel because it's on the Nevada line. So, you know, it's interesting to see now the rest of the world kind of not only catch up, but start to pass us when it comes to regulations. And, and that's a little concerning. Um, but with all that information, you know, you said that you got picked because you lived in Jacksonville. They were looking for someone to manage their relationship with Vitacan. I know that, you know, they're your primary partner here in Florida. So your job, as I understand, I'm going to oversimplify the crap out of it, is to fly around the country and find out who makes the best weed so you can work with them for Takuna Law. Uh, it's, it, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a rough gig, let me tell you, getting to go and tour cannabis grows for a living. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, someone's got to live that life. You know, I, um, nobody like you came to my school on career day. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, what's really exciting too, is looking at States where the, uh, where the, the legislation is favorable, uh, where the, the regulations in reference to product mix are favorable and, uh, the, and then the, uh, the legislation has included government funding for research. Um, Michigan is a great example of that. So uh, Michigan has stated that a fixed percentage of their annual uh, revenue will, uh, the tax revenue will go towards research through the University of Michigan for, uh, for clinical applications of cannabis, um, primarily starting with pain and PTSD. So we're um, through our partners uh, in Michigan gonna get to participate and onshore some research for a change. So it'll be uh, very exciting to see, uh, you know, not only research done in the US, but research done, you know, with our products. That's really cool. Uh, on that note too, going back to the, the job, I'm actually really excited about the research. We're gonna have to circle back to that, but going back to what you're doing, you know, when I, I watched one interview with you and I know that you were saying that the strains that you guys cultivated were, you know, they were cultivated in the nineties. And you got them to where, you know, Takoon got them to where they needed to be from a, a medical or a clinical standpoint and let them go. Right. So, you know, you make the joke that if people looked at your weed, they may not think it's the, the stuff that's being put out in these California indoor grows. But it was meant it was grown and its intention has a specific purpose for a specific outcome or a specific feeling. So mm -hmm. on that note, as I learned more and more about cultivation across the countries and across the states here in, in our country, you know, as I understand it, if you try to cultivate the same seed in California, like Humboldt versus South Florida with the humidity and everything else, it's not easy to do that. So in reality, I make the joke that you fly around and see as the best weed, but is it really, will they be able to produce our strains the way that we want them to, because they have the right input or the right, 
I, I can't say the word right, but terrar, if you will. Right. So yeah. is that yeah. part of what you're looking for as you go around? Because you, you guys do have very well-known products already. Yeah, and certainly there is there is a uh, a an element of of the uh, the terroir or the the grow methodologies that that does impact in particular the potencies of terpenes uh, and and how they grow in concert with each other within the plant. So we certainly do pay a lot of attention to uh, to grow methodology and things of that nature. Um, but what's really critical for us when we're selecting a partner is not necessarily. Um, the grow conditions, while they are important, um, we can defeat some of those deviations through regular refresh of tissue culture. Um, but the what's more important to us is that we find people who are passionate about patient care, who are uh, focused on the clinical outcomes as opposed to the money, uh, and who have staying power. Because one of the most devastating things that we can have happen is um, to have our medicine available in a certain geography, um, see somebody get relief from that therapy, and then you know the company goes under and they no longer have access to it. Um, anybody who's truly used uh, cannabis as medicine knows that hunt to find the right blend of terpenes and cannabinoids that, that is therapeutic to you uh, is, is a frustrating process. But once you finally find it, it's, it's the difference. It makes all the difference in the world in, in quality of life. So it's really critical to us that we find the right people um, and then grow methodology can be altered uh, around that. And, and to be honest with you, um, part of that grow methodology is the importance of understanding there are growers that try and tell plants what to do and there are growers that listen to plants and, and yeah. our plants need to be listened to. They are um, those that, uh, that, that are not going to, because they're older genetics, they're not going to take newts the way that modern hybrids do and, uh, you know, just shove as many newts and as much light down their throat as you can and you'll get big plants. Uh-uh, not with the coon strains. You got to listen to them. You got to know when to, when to starve them, when to feed them, uh, when to water them, when to dry them, you know, and, and, and let them be your guide. Um, and I think that that's, you know, really, really often difficult to find a grower who will understand that. You know, it's funny that you say that because when you say, you know, talk to the plants and looking for someone who's really passionate, you, when you talk about that, like it, to me, you're hundred percent, right? Like you, there's going to be someone who might be like, oh yeah, I listen to plants and this, well, how do you grow? Well, this, I do X, Y, and Z and that and another, not just the reactionary thing, like what you said. So you really do to me seem like you need to have someone who's extremely passionate that is, you know, has uh, is a botanist at heart is, is a scientist at heart is someone who's going to you know, really read what the plant needs. And, and those interviews must be really interesting to figure out who the right person is. They, they are, they are. And it's, and it's funny because there, there isn't really any one profile, right? It's, it's, it, but it, you, you see the results in their products. And it's funny because we've got guys who are incredibly data-driven where they, you know, every 10th of a, of a degree in temperature or every uh, minute adjustment to vapor pressure in their grow, they're, they're paying attention to and seeing what the outcomes are on the other end. And then we've got other guys who just have that feel, that inherent uh, understanding of what a plant is going to want when. And so, you know, I, I don't think that there's any one perfect solution. It's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. Uh, I often think it would be a real riot to get, you know, the, the, uh, 10 lead growers that we've got around the country in one room and see them uh, argue with each other about, uh, about our plants. Um, I, I really want to organize that at some point. It should be a lot of fun. I would love to be a fly on the wall for that conversation. I was just about to say, like, I'm sure you have some amazing stories that I would love to hear off air and then figure out which ones we can tell. Off air. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And, but you know, I, I, again, I'm not somebody who believes that there's just one way to grow. I mean, we've got guys who do living soil, rock wool, aeroponics, deep water hydro, you know, everything from, from end to end on grow methodology and, and, and we're not going to force any one methodology down their throat. If they think that that's the way that plants work and they grow, um, as long as they listen to our plants, we're happy with it. That's awesome, man. So I want to talk about the products here, right? Because I know I, I told you I screwed up the end of this meeting. I want to make sure we get everything. I go to your <laughs> website, and one of the things I like about it, again, 
you know, and the reason I keep saying I like this, let me give some background on this. I, I work in marketing in the cannabis space. I see a lot of brands marketing. I see a lot of their messages. I see a lot of their value props. And at the end of the day, to me, there are way too many people that are, are banking on the fact that they're advertising that they sell the best wheat. And that is such a subjective topic, right? Because, you know, I, I can tell you my own personal tastes have evolved over the, my, my 10 to 12 years of consumption that, I don't even, you know, I, the, what I thought was the best three years ago may not be the best today. Maybe it was stronger. Maybe it was weaker. Maybe it was something different. Right. So that's so subjective. The companies to me that truly stand for something and talk about the effect, the after what the, the why of their products to me are the ones that have staying power and the ones that deserve to be around and continue to grow. And, you know, I, I make that there's been a couple of countries, uh, companies across the country that I've said that too, within my own calls and, and marketing discussions, but to Ken, to me is one of those companies you are met, you know, a, a wellness and medically focused company. You do what you do. You do it well. You have your products. There's been a lot of thought put into those products. And then even when I go to your website, I think it's a great site to send somebody to as a potential first time cannabis user. And, and I'm saying that because of the, the tacoon selector or my tacoon up in the type right hand corner that literally walks you through a, a quiz to help find the right product for you. Um, is that something newer? Or is that something you guys have had for a while that's just now become digitized? Uh, no, we've had that for for quite some time, uh, both both digital and and not. And and honestly, because we are a, we're a learning organization and constantly evolving, um, that web page, as as great as it is, is about to be replaced with a newer version. Because what we really uh, strive to do is um, not to advertise, not to get caught in the flash, but to uh, give as much information to those who are looking for it as possible. And we like to do that everywhere uh, and offer different entry points uh, to that information, be it uh, through that type of tutorial for a, for a novice user or provide the, you know, the very in-depth uh, clinical information that a, a, uh, somebody who's very clinically focused may want or, or even just provide you know, those, those real uh, hard facts that, a, uh, that an, a, a more advanced user might be looking for. Yeah, but but to me, that's so needed because there are so many people that don't know anything and then they're reliant on their most educated friend or their most educated neighbor. And again, that person is going to be biased based on their own personal taste. You know, my group of friends, I can I literally at this point, just because I've been doing this for long, I can tell you who has taste similar to me and who doesn't. And when my friends, you know, will ask me about different strains and everything else. I don't tell them what I like. I ask them what they like and what they've liked in the past. And then I'll go on Leafly and be like, well, according to what you've liked, I think you're going to like this one. I still could be wrong, but that's what I try to do because again, I'm a steward of this industry. I want to make sure that people have a great first experience. There's a joke that's been going around the internet for a while. that says, if you want free weed, just tell a stoner you've never smoked before. Right. <laughs> yeah. But that's, yeah. That, that's an antiquated way of, I don't, I don't want to introduce someone to cannabis where they get to a point where they don't want to use it again, because that doesn't help anybody. And that just puts another enemy out there. Right. We're not even yeah. an enemy, even, even if they're not against it, it's, you know, I, yeah, I smoked one time. It just, it just wasn't for me. And that's not good. Right. Even I told you myself, my, my personal preferences have changed over the years. I remember for a while I was leaning higher and higher THC, stronger and stronger weed. And then I got to a point where it's like, I want to use this a little bit more thera therapeutically and medicinally and everything else. And I'll look for lower THC content. And then I learned that that doesn't really do that much for me. My own personal experience, I think the higher the THC, it's just the longer the effects last and the lower the THC, the less, the least amount of time it lasts. And then I start looking at terpene profiles and everything else. And I know we can dig into that, but I, I want to talk about where was I going with it? Oh, different products and stuff and, and entry level and, and getting yeah. people introduced. So looking through, you know, your products, I think you guys have a great lineup for an initial person trying to get into cannabis. And I know, I remember, I think it was the couch lock interview. You talked about the fact that you guys are an extraction company actually at heart, you know, that that's really where most of the products come from. I, I would, I, I, I firmly uh, believe that, you know, I mean, yes, we, we put out flour and we put out some, some damn good flour, by the way, but, but really, uh, you know, we at our heart do uh, focus mostly on extracted products because uh, those are, uh, there, there's a wider variety of those for, um, uh, for clinical application. 
you know, we, we have to be cognizant of the fact that when we are talking about, you know, the very, very clinical applications, um, those morbidities or, or conditions that people may have um, affect their ability to consume things in certain ways. So you might have somebody, I know, for example, when I'm having a, a really horrible Crohn's attack, uh, the thought of even of, a, of smoking or putting a gummy in my mouth is horrid. Um, but, you know, I can, I can stomach a tincture under my, under my tongue. Um, but there are other people who, you know, that's just not going to do it for, and they need the rapid onset or the rescue inhaler type effect of a vape. So we, we really try to focus a lot on, uh, you know, varying delivery methods so that folks can tailor their therapy to what they need. Um, and it's interesting that you said that about in terms of THC uh, concentration and whatnot. I mean, yes, we have some very high THC stuff. We have some very low THC stuff, but I st I've started to notice that um, the further people get into their cannabis journey, um, uh, as they, they really tend to uh, lean more on ratio products um, to get a, a blend of cannabinoids into their system that, um, well, yes, it gives them a certain degree of intoxication, also gives them the therapeutic value of adding CBD to that regimen. 100%. I actually, so it was funny um, to give backstory again here, because I like to explain things in case, you know, we have new members of the podcast. But back in July, I remember I saw an article about the research of CBD helping fight the effects of COVID, right? And when I saw the first article, I go, that's bullshit. Our industry doesn't need that. That's, that's the type of shit that gets in trouble. Exactly the same reaction when I saw it. <laughs> I think we all did. Fast forward four or five months later, I'm talking to Steve D'Angelo on the podcast and I see two, three, four articles. And I bring it up to Steve and I told him that he said the same thing. And then I go, you know, it makes sense because COVID causes inflammation in different areas. And although the FDA won't let us say it, CBD is one of the best fighters of inflammation out there, right? I know I can say it. I don't know if you can agree with me or not, but I'm going to say it. And so I remember when I, I got COVID, I, you know, and I wanted to continue using cannabis and everything else. I go, I went and I got a one-to-one -one CBD gummy because, or CAC CBD gummy. Cause I'm like, well, this is going to be my medication. This is what's going to help me. And I actually did feel better. I'm not saying folks that go out and get a CBD gummy and it's going to help you fight COVID. I'm not endorsing that. But from my personal experience, I saw that there was legitimate university research being done on this and, and I tried it. Well, I think I think that there is a little bit of science to back it up. And again, as as uh, very much, I had the same reaction. Like bullshit, we don't need this uh, type of, of of chicanery coming into the cannabis industry. It's just crazy to the point how of we're how we're you know how we think that way because we're so protective of our industry. When we see something that's a brand new thing that no one's had, and they say cannabis solves it, we're like, no, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but but the fact of the matter is that when if you think of the endocannabinoid system as a micro regulator to other systems then it starts to, it does start to make sense and it's not that the cannabis is curing uh, or preventing covid it's that it's helping your body remember how to fight things uh, and it's helping your immune system do the things that your immune system was designed to do so uh, uh, yeah, I think that it's, it's really easy when you come across a new application to first say, that's ridiculous. But then when you think more about it, you think about what your body's own natural response should be. And the cannabinoids are really just assisting your body to do that, which is what it's intended to do. Yeah, no, it is crazy. And it's funny. I do see people more leaning towards ratioed products or low THC products and everything else. Because I was talking to somebody about this earlier. You know, sometimes you don't want to go the full Monty, you know, and sometimes there are times where it's like, I've just got a lot of stuff on my mind and I'm stressed and I'm having a bad day. And, you, you know, uh, I don't know. I got bills coming up. I got a kid on the way, all that stuff. And sometimes I hit or two of, of the right strain for me allows me to put it in perspective and realize that I need to focus on the task at hand is because all that stuff that I'm worrying about is going to get worse. If I don't focus on the task, like maybe I fought with my wife that morning, maybe I just had a bad day or, or whatever it is. And I'm one of those people who will drag that into the office with me and it'll, it'll affect the rest of my day. But if I can get something 
And, you know, I know a lot of, 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 of detractors will say, oh, well, he's just smoking his problems. Well, he's like, no, my, the problems are still there. I'm still aware of them, but I realize they're not important right now. I realize that if I don't go with a clear mind into work and have a good day there, that those financial problems, those other problems are only going to get worse, right? Because I'm, I'm focused on the downside, not the upside, right? So, you know, for me, and I think a lot of people are this way, if you figure out a way that it can help you, and don't get me wrong, during my experimentation process, I went too far many, many times. It, it happens. But once you figure it out, I think that's where a lot of people need to get to where it's not like I'm an alcoholic and I'm drinking my problems away to forget. It's just, I need to put things in perspective and understand what's important and what's not in that moment to be able to move forward. And I think that's really where cannabis gives people, I won't say superpowers, but gives people an edge. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, 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 you know, it's, I think not only from an employment and, uh, and, and, you know, intellectual standpoint, but also well, um, from an athletic standpoint, I one of my colleagues, uh, Bernie uh, is a really, really big fan of, having a ratio product right before playing basketball or playing tennis. Um, you know, not only does the, the CBD help loosen up his muscles and whatnot, but uh, it makes him more uh, focused on reactive and less distracted uh, by, by what's going on uh, throughout the game or, or what's going on outside of the game and allows him to focus on it. So uh, I think there's, there, there are a lot of applications for, for cannabis that folks don't really think about. And, you know, you think about cannabis making you um, inactive is of course the stereotype, but it can also be a great tool for when you are active. Yeah. It, well, it's funny. I, I bring it, just give bringing up. I can't believe that in, in this day and age, I keep referencing internet memes, but at the end of the day, there was a picture of Michael Phelps and Usain Bolt. And they said something like both of these athletes use cannabis and they have like 48 combined gold medals between them. So it's like, but you, you have 100% point. I mean, I'm friends with Ricky Williams. This is a conversation that we have uh, often about cannabis and sports. And I'm really interested to see a day where not only, you know, this year we have most of the major sports leagues not testing for cannabis as a banned substance, at least in the out in the off season. But I'd be really interested to see a day where they are allowed to use um, at the very least CBD products or even low ratioed products in sports because I, again, it keep bring, referencing Steve D'Angelo and I feel like a name dropper, but in that conversation, we talked about days where I'm like, I'm having a rough day. And my biggest thing with working out is getting to it, doing that first rep. It's, I have such a mental lock where it's like, I don't want to do this, but once I start doing it, you feel good. You get that dopamine rush. You'll finish the workout. There are days where I will smoke a little bit. And then all of a sudden, like my shoulders feel a little bit looser. I start throwing some air punches. And next thing I know I'm in the garage and the heavy bag. So it's like, I, I think that lazy stoner stigma needs to officially be retired because most of those people are lazy people who happen to also consume cannabis. It's going the other way. It's not the cannabis that's making them that way. Well, I mean, you know, it's also the, the idea that, uh, you know, folks who consume cannabis can't uh, uphold a coherent thought or, or engage in a coherent conversation. And, and you and I have been sitting here talking for about 45 minutes now, and we're both uh, cannabis consumers, and I don't think either of us are inarticulate individuals. So uh, that's, uh, <laughs> as I, I, I think that we're, uh, we're pretty much done with that, uh, with that stereotype. 100%. So we're getting close to the hour here, but I want to talk to you about a specific strain because this is where I get selfish, right? And <laughs> I've heard great things about the Alaska strain. Now, this is how my idiot brain works. I didn't look at it, never did any research. For some reason, I heard Alaska and my idiot brain just goes, oh, a lot of people like that. I bet it helps them relax. It's probably a pretty strong indica. That's pretty cool. Alaska, you know, it gets dark there. They have like six months of darkness or something. So it's gotta be an indica. So when I finally meet you and start doing the research and learn that it's a sativa, which is my jam, which is what I love. I'm like, why haven't I tried this yet? So is this one of your, your in, in more modern times, one of your, your leading products here? It is. It actually uh, is likely our, our our top selling products in Florida. I, I would say that it, it accounts for somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty percent of all of our sales in Florida. Um, uh, you know, and 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 it certainly is very popular in California and other markets as well. Um, Alaska is uh, is is about as close to a land race as you can get without actually being a land race, uh, and it is uh, you know it's it's an old school sativa. And I think that's why so many people enjoy it. Um, it's never been hybridized. It's never been crossed with indicas. So it doesn't have that kind of confusing terpene profile that I feel leads to 
you know, the sativa paranoia that folks get, which by the way, I, I suffer from sativa paranoia myself uh, at times. And, and I've never had that with Alaska because it's just, it's clean, it's uplifting, it's lucid. It's, it's really, uh, it, it, it really, to me, it just, it, it takes a, a, a bad day and makes it a good one. Um, and it's certainly something that uh, I can consume and, and still be able to work uh, function, do spreadsheets, you know, do complex, complex uh, financial calculations, things of that nature. Uh, so it doesn't have, to me, what you get out of the more hybridized sativas that can really kind of bog down your mind and, and uh, eliminate some of that lucidity. So, see, so this is what I love about the podcast, because I talk about things that like I kind of know and experience, but I don't understand the why behind them. And then, you know, I talk to someone like you and explain it. First, I'm a moron for my assumption about Alaska, because I honestly feel like out of all the strains in Florida, I really think it will be one of my favorites. I say it will be because I'm gonna have to go this weekend and get it. But, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's funny because you make a good point when I go. Again, for those of you out there that are going to tell me that that there's no sativa in the codes, all hybrids now. Listen, I'm talking about the old school words, what, the men, what they meant. One makes you more energy, you went up. The other one's more of the couch. You know the terms. Um, but, you know, there are certain times where you get a, a, a sativa and you have like a nice initial rust, creativity, energy. And then you kind of just get like tired. And like, especially on, on the tail end of it, you just got kind of tired where it's like, I'm more tired than if I would have just smoked a pure indica or something along those lines. So... I always am on the hunt for something like this. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Jack Herrera. I'm a big fan of like the Cindy 99 strains and things like that. Um, Mimosa, Tangy. So, you know, something like this, I, I really like, I'm very excited to try it. So I'm very, I'm sorry personally that I'm so dumb. I couldn't even make the proper assumptions about it. Looking through, you know, the rest of the stuff that you guys have, for people that are new to cannabis, where would you recommend that they start besides the selector? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that, uh, you know, that, that Alaska is, is a great one uh, to start with because it is, you know, more of a, of a daytime, very clean, very lucid uh, strain. I also think that midnight is a great place to start for folks uh, who are uh, not a novice because it is a, a ratio. It's a one to one. It's a naturally occurring one to one, by the way. And uh, it wow. is an, about a 90 10 sativa leaning hybrid. Um, so, which is kind of counterintuitive again to the name. I know our names are, um, our strain names are often a bit of a marketing nightmare. You'd think that Midnight uh, would be a, uh, an indica uh, being the <laughs> nighttime hour, but uh, it's actually called that because um, uh, it, typically in flower, it'll evidence about 12% THC, 12% CBD, adding up to 24 or midnight on the, on the 24 hour clock. So um, I think that that's another great place for folks to start because it's, uh, it, it's a very easy entry level blend of, of THC and CBD. Uh, by the way, you mentioned mimosa and I will say outside of our own stuff, if you are a mimosa fan, do not sleep on the new Stanley Brothers uh, champagne breakfast strain, uh, which uh, is, is a mimosa derivative and it is really some very, very nice stuff. I'm going to have to check that out. Who has Stanley Brothers in Florida? Vitacan as well. Oh, Vitacan. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> uh, actually, not to bring Susie back into this conversation, but I was looking on the, uh, I think it was, I was looking on the Vitacan site and she actually recommended that one to me. I just never actually pulled the trigger on the order because I'm super lazy and you guys are in Deerfield and I live in Delray. And that's just, it, again, it, it's, it's me. It's not you. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I guess that's probably the closest one to you because you, you got West Palm and Stewart that are also kind of in the area. <laughs> yeah, no, listen, the Deerfield store is plenty close to me. I'm just lazy. And, you know, that's how <laughs> it goes. So um, I got I to sit in my studio and bullshit with cool people like you instead of going. And I'm and I'm pretty confident Vitacan delivers anyway. So that's no excuse on my part. They do. They do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Tom, you, you started here to kind of bring this all full circle. So you started with Takoon in Jacksonville, managing the Vitacan relationship. You're now the chief revenue officer of the United States division. You know, you're a representative of the whole country, you know, where, how, how has, you know, looking at the, the progress that Takoon has made in the U S you know, where, you know, from when you started to today, how have you guys done that? What's the reception? You know, I, I'm just really curious because, 
it sits to me in a market where it's bringing new people in, but we also have this legacy market, you know, especially in Southern California of people who want the gas or the strongest and all this, it's just a traditional way that they want it. It's a subsector of the industry, but I'm just really interested to hear your experience in growing the original cannabis company, if you will, the original medical cannabis company. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a wild ride, man. When I first started, um, we were only actually on the shelf in Delaware. Uh, and, uh, so, you know, since then we've grown to a, a large number of States, uh, obviously we've been uh, quite successful here in Florida. Um, and I think a lot of that is based on the fact that even for those folks who are, may not have one of the conditions that we've researched, um, the fact that we are out there performing research adds a level of comfort to folks who are curious about cannabis, uh, or intrigued by cannabis. And there's these folks who've been told their entire life that cannabis is evil, uh, that it's a gateway drug, that it's going to bring upon the downfall of their, of their life and their finances. Um, now we have, give them hard data to say, no, there's, there's something here. Uh, we've actually researched this. We've taken the time to prove that there are uh, ailments that can be alleviated um, or at least eased by using cannabis. And so again, even if they don't have one of those particular ailments, uh, you know, they just like that comfort level of the fact that we're coming from the side of science and, and applying that to uh, the cannabis industry. So, um, yeah, I, I think that as a result of that, we do have a, a higher uh, initial population uh, when we enter a market of novice us users than other brands might. Um, but then, you know, once people actually start to get in and we're, we get some market maturity and they try our stuff, you know, I think most, most folks uh, who are, uh, or a lot of folks who are uh, fans of cannabis do enjoy the products that we produce as well as find clinical relief from them. Oh, for sure. I, uh, I, I truly see you guys, you know, as the industry continues to mature, being one of the standouts in this space, just because there's a true genuine story behind it. Like nothing against most of the companies out there, but there are a lot of genuine bullshit stories out there because we've only been around for a year, two years, five years, and people are trying to build a brand around it. But Takoon has a genuine story that people can relate to it. I can see a movie being made about its origins. You already talked about the documentary, right? So um, I, I am excited to see what you guys do in the future on that note, you know, we we're in may, there's a lot of time left. We're, we're looking at the tail end of the pandemic here. Um, uh, what can we expect from Takoon later this year, next year? What are some of the things that you can share that excite you? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, you know, our, our product blend is different in every state. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you will see here in Florida us launching uh, strain-specific edibles, which uh, nobody is doing strain-specific edibles in Florida right now. Uh, you know, but those will be, uh, you know, uh, full spectrum, uh, fully That's terped. That's really cool, not to cut you off, but I just, like you said it, and then it took a second for me to register. That's actually awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, we, uh, just this week, we went on the shelves in Michigan. Uh, Michigan is uh, obviously a very different state. So, well, we, uh, from a consumer standpoint, so, well, we ha will have, you know, our basic lineup there of, of vapes, tinctures, flour, et cetera. Um, it's the first state in which we're launching a lot of concentrates. So I believe we're going on the shelf with uh, five different textures of concentrates, both uh, solventless and, and solvent based. Uh, in Michigan, um, you know, we're, we're likely to be on the shelf here, depending on growth cycles. By the end of the year, we should be on the shelf in, uh, in Maryland and Arizona. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're continuing to expand, uh, continuing to innovate with products. Um, the other thing that we, I'm, I and myself am uh, very uh, excited about is in some states, again, not so much in Florida because of the restrictive nature of the laws here, but in other states, you'll see um, our strain agnostic line coming online uh, called Takoon Elements. And that's really the brainchild of uh, our head of product development, Essa. Uh, you may see his stuff on, on Instagram with his Essa's answers. He's, a, he's our mad scientist. Um, but that's really more about delivery methodology. So you'll th see things like uh, 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 nano emulsified powders, uh, energy shots, uh, you know, uh, THC based energy shots, uh, you know, all kinds of different uh, innovative product uh, delivery. Uh, one of the things he's come up with is a methodology of, of infusing uh, flour with concentrate and terpenes so that we end up with a, 
an enhanced pre-roll that uh, you know generally runs anywhere. Uh, it's think a dab, a dab, and a pre and a joint at the same time it, because they're generally running around forty percent THC. So uh, you know we we uh, love that line and love seeing the innovation that comes out of uh, out of our science side. Dude, that that's cool. That see, that's the part of this industry that makes me really happy is the R and D, the new delivery methodologies, and everything else. I'm excited to see that happen. I'm assuming that it's going to launch in California before anywhere else. Most of this stuff. Yeah, we have a few of those items on the on the shelf in California right now, in particular with the uh, the the, uh, the the shots. But we also, you know, those infused pre rolls we rolled out in Maine. We're about to roll them out uh, in Michigan. So uh, you're seeing stuff uh, all, all over the country. We'll be able to launch some of these new products. Very cool. Well, Tom, thank you so much for your time today. This has been really enjoyable. I definitely want, I want to do this again um, after I try everything. Once you guys have some, some of this new stuff coming out and everything else, and maybe we can get the mad scientist on with you too. I think that'd be a lot of fun. I, I always, always happy to have a conversation with you, sir. And also always happy to include Essa because he's, he's a really brilliant guy to listen to. So thank Great. you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. Before we let you go, you want to plug the website, any social media or anything else? I mean, you know, uh, tacunolam.com will be launching the new website here probably in the next two weeks. And of course, uh, tacunolam USA on Instagram, uh, where it's best place to catch up on all of our new product launches and, uh, and new launches in new states. Very cool. Well, Tom, thank you. And thank you to everybody at home for watching another episode of Elevate Your Grind. Of course, if you missed any part of this episode, you can catch it again on Wednesday on our YouTube page at www.youtube.com slash Elevate Your Grind. Of course, it will also be on any of your podcast platforms. If you don't want to look at my face, just search for Elevate Your Grind. Folks, we are done for the night. We'll be back here live on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll be here at facebook.com slash business group. And we'll be on LinkedIn and at cannabis lab folks it's been another episode of elevate your grind we'll see you next week